Good morning. My name is Rabbi Chaim Beliak. I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, the 14th uh, in a series of wonderful programs that we've been able to bring to you entitled Freighted Legacies. Uh, this is a series of programs that we describe as a bridge between the uh, culture of Jews in Poland and uh, I would say Poland and beyond the pale, uh, the opportunity for Jews uh, throughout the world to learn about their heritage uh, in Poland uh, and for uh, people in Poland to learn about the rich culture of Jews uh, in uh, Poland. I'm uh, pleased to be joined today uh, by a personal friend, um, who is going to share with us? Uh, I'm afraid that Haim is having a little bit uh, of a technical challenges. He already reported before that there is a difficulty with internet connection at his area. So we are very happy to have with us today Karen Goodman, uh, who will be uh, talking about uh, the book rhymings, uh, Dancing Between Words. And uh, she will also tell us a little bit more uh, about her work and herself uh, in a moment. Uh, Rabbi Haim, would you like to add something? I don't know what I... Um, <laughs> uh, I was unable to say that I wanted to say that uh, I had the privilege of uh, traveling with uh, Karen Goodman, who is a remarkable uh, person who has integrated the life of uh, a very gifted dancer very gifted researcher, um, a choreographer, a uh, uh, filmographer uh, into uh, a world that we're going to be um, introduced uh, uh, into uh, in terms of the, the world of the Poland that we were able to see and the Poland that we have imagined. And uh, she's going to bring us into the world of the Dybbuk um, and uh, it's the uh, the uh, near the hundredth anniversary of the uh, capturing of these uh, tales and myths, uh, and uh, the return to this uh, the remix as Karen is uh, going to present to us. And I simply want to say that uh, this is both um, the, the the preservation of something and the creative reintroduction of uh, something. Karen's work is remarkable um, and uh, it's a great privilege to have her. And uh, we, as we do always at the conclusion of our uh, uh, time together, there'll be an opportunity for people to hear about uh, what is happening with Ukrainian refugees and the efforts that uh, uh, Friends of Jewish Renewal together with our partners in Poland um, are doing to, to help support the uh, uh, the refugees that are in Poland. And I, we'll also hear uh, uh, briefly uh, from our um, chair, um, Marek Yuzowski. And uh, I wanna thank our um, coordinator and uh, executive director, um, uh, Dominika for uh, her good work. And I do not wanna delay uh, because I know that um, Karen has timed this, and I want to tell her right now that if we go a little over, it's okay. Uh, so she doesn't have to worry about um, being exactly on time. Uh, Karen, uh, the internet is yours. We're very pleased that you're with us. Um, uh, please bring us into the world you've created and the world that you brought uh, to us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Chaim. Thank you. Um to this whole program to freight legacy legacies. I'm I'm really happy to be part of this. Um, uh, Chaim talks about this world and this is a world I entered um, already later in my life as it were. So um, I'm just going to start right away because a lot of, of what um, you'll learn in in what my in my remarks what what's going on. Um, okay, 
Let me see. I was. There is nothing more real, but more elusive than dance. Real as the bodies it lives in. Elusive as the spirit that moves them. Fragile as those bodies that age, forget, are destroyed or exiled. Varied as time and circumstance. I was thinking about the past when I wrote that 20 years ago. We usually look to the past for clues to the present. Now the present is the best context for the history I'll share with you. Um, I'm gonna start by quoting from a dance review by Jennifer Homans from just three weeks ago in the New Yorker magazine, except I've updated her statistics to the most current. And I'm going to stop the screen share. Um, according, she writes, according to UNESCO, the war in Ukraine has damaged 213 sites, 92 religious, 16 museums, 77 buildings of historical and artistic interest, 18 monuments, 10 libraries. What about the dances, she asks. This is harder to calculate because dance is essentially stored in bodies. When Oleksandr Shapova, a longtime dancer for the National Opera of Ukraine, died as a soldier in combat in September, the Russians killed both the man and the dances he contained. Maybe choreographer Alexei Ratmansky had this in mind when he made Wartime Elegy, which had just premiered in Seattle with Pacific Northwest Ballet. Dedicated to the people of Ukraine, it is the first dance he has made since the Russian invasion. During the opening night bows, he unfurled a Ukrainian flag and held it high over his head." Unquote. Ratmansky, born in 1968 to a Ukrainian Jewish father and Russian mother, grew up in Kyiv, where his parents still live. He trained in Moscow at the Bolshoi, but returned in 86 to dance with the National Ballet of Ukraine, where he met his wife. He danced and then choreographed internationally and was resident choreographer at American Ballet Theater. He also continued to work in Russia, including directing the Bolshoi Ballet from 2004 to 2008. In Moscow to stage a new work for the Bolshoi, he fled the day he fled the day the invasion began. He has since helped form the United Ukrainian Ballet Company, based in The Hague, on whom he recently set his version of Giselle. One, one of the sources of the ballet's story, originally staged in 1841 in Paris, is a passage by the poet Heinrich Heine, a convert from Judaism. The ballet is about the tragedy that can lurk in hidden identities and the power of love to defy death. These are also themes in the Dybbuk. Ratmansky said about himself recently, <clears throat> to be able to function, I have to shut out my Russian history. <clears throat> I will come to the moment when I need to glue together my identity and come in peace to that part of my life. Homans writes, she writes, in Seattle, Ratmansky has given us a dance for Ukraine performed with precision and poignancy by American dancers, unquote. It includes Ukrainian folk music and a score by Valentin Silvestrov. Ukraine's most famous living composer. There are projections of artworks by Ukrainian Jewish artist Matvey Weisberg, whose work in the past has portrayed Jewish themes and since 2013 has been part of the Ukrainian artists' Maidan protest movement. The Ukrainian folk dances, which appear in the middle of 
piece are performed in front of folk paintings by Maria Privichenko, who lived from 1909 to 1997, whose work has become a symbol of Ukrainian protest. And you can see those are her paintings in the backdrop there. My maternal grandparents were from Ukraine, Berdichev. I knew little of them or of my father's, grand, my father's parents from Bielsk and Bucharest. So about 25 years ago, I thought to at least learn how they danced at weddings and bar mitzvahs. I have a master's degree in dance and have, to have seen and have seen dance from all over the world. Yet to know so little of those dances felt wrong. So I set out to learn more. It's been an ongoing adventure. Workshops, Yiddish class, research, interviews, writing, teaching, choreographing from folk materials. But in 2016, on a Poland tour with Rabbi Beliak and Dr. Richard Hecht also helping to lead, it all came together for another reason. The instinct to bind together my identities as this late in life student of Yiddish dance and as a dancer by dancing. But let me go back to 1999. I was in a performance of older professional dancers where we each had a couple of minutes to tell a quick dance story. I heard a woman my mother's age talk about being in a Jewish theater and dance company here in LA. In the dressing room, I told her of my mission. She came, she became my guide and dear friend. 80-year-old Miriam Rocklin was so knowledgeable and charming that I felt compelled to film her. I wasn't a filmmaker, but if this was just for my education, Dainu, that would have been enough. It turned out pretty well. And this is the cover for Come Let Us Dance, which has had a small ongoing life as a Yiddish dance resource since 2002. And here's a little clip from that film. Women wore the skirts and they put the shoulder forward, they put their head over their shoulder and the next one this way, next one this way, and the next one this way. So that it becomes a little bit of a flirtatious, you know, showing off. Now the hands are terribly important in the Eastern Jewish dance. All you have to do is stand in front of the synagogue on Friday night or some Saturday morning and see, to see them talk. The Jewish destiny is the open hand, the closed hand, the eyes, and this, and oh my God, and what that. They are talking with their hands. You used to see when the Jew sits on his hand, he stutters. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam had known Miriam had known two important Polish-born chore choreographers who were choreographers, dancers, teachers, working from their traditional roots, Nathan Wazanski and Benjamin Zemach. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about them shortly. I also bought a copy of the 1937 Yiddish language film, The Dybbuk, to learn the several authentic authentic Yiddish dances in it, and began to learn about S. Ansky, its author. But I'm going back even further in time uh, from my story. I've loved dance since I was th three. So I've had a lot of time to think about its value and have written about that. And I'm gonna read a little of that. In dance, the instrument of the body gives shape to thought and feeling. It embodies the past, present, and future of the dancer, signifying both identity and change. Dance embodies mystery. We have the mysterious ability, kinesthesia, to feel the movement of others, even when we ourselves are still. Perhaps this is what suggests that there is some connective tissue, something greater than ourselves that we can join through movement. Dance is not just about moving, it is about being. 
because it lives in the dimensions that life inhabits, time, space, and energy. When these elements are fully engaged, participating or watching, moving or hardly moving, there is a chance to marvel and somehow feel transformed. The self taken by the body beyond its limits to that realm of spirit. Yet it is our bodies that ask the existential questions. What is needed to survive? What actions should we take to influence or celebrate a positive outcome or lament a loss? Life, death, what happens after? What does it all mean? This is where I think dance, ritual, and religion meet. How this came to be expressed by the Ashkenazim was my question. Jewish dance history starts in Torah and Talmud. There are words in Torah for whirling, gyrating, skipping, jumping, limping, leaping, trembling, and more. Baruch, which means praised or blessed, comes from berach, to knee or kneel. A word for holiday is chag, a journey or pilgrimage, and chagag is to dance in a circle. There is Miriam, for example, leading the women dancing after crossing the Reed Sea, and David dancing so ecstatically that he sheds his clothes as he leads the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem for the first time. It is a positive commandment, a mitzvah, to attend the bride, accord her honor, praise her, dance for her, provide for her, make her happy. And that has become part of our tradition. What to do? Rabbi Samuel ben Isaac danced with three myrtle branches, setting them on fire and juggling them. Myrtle symbolized beauty, good luck, hope, immortality, justice, sweetness. Rav Acha danced with the bride on his shoulders. True or mythic, wedding dancing seems to be a consecration. And I would say of the transformations of identity of the couple, of new connections between families. And for the mystics of the union between the male and female aspects of the divine. Although the ancient dances were lost, new ones grew wherever Jews lived, including in the Pale of Settlement, as they were needed. Woodge, born and raised, Nathan Vizansky, writing in 1954, quoted an old Yiddish proverb, Ayid, vetzich nicht, avek lozentansen, glatazoi. A Jew does not let himself go a dancing without reason. In 1930, Vizansky was perhaps the first to write about and analyze Yiddish dance in the US. Raised Hasidic and Hader educated, he also took ballet classes with an older sister and read Yiddish translations of Western literature and of the political and social ferment of the times. The ballet and theater performing he pursued in Berlin were cut short by World War I, and he was detained as an enemy alien. In 1920, he came to the US, although well known, very well known, for his performing and choreographies and Jewish themes. His most enduring contribution is his 1942 book, 10 Jewish Folk Dances, written in Chicago to teach the dances. It features the work of European born artists, Todros Geller, and liturgical um, composer, Max Janowski, who arranged the traditional music. In the book, Zanski gives a version of the Talmudic mitzvah dance, which he calls the kosher dance, in which the purified bride is therefore a kosher bride, the dance is a great event, now I'm quoting Vizansky, um, and it is customary to make the most of it, calling the father, the bride, excuse me, the father, the rabbi, 
or important community figures to dance with her to signify that they are now entrusting her to the groom who is now solely responsible for her. Placed in the center of the room with her face veiled, each of them in turn take the opposite end of a handkerchief she holds since women and men shouldn't touch and briefly dances with her. By dancing, meaning she remains still and maybe he just takes a few steps to the right together, to the left together, maybe a few more times, but they are connected as she is now connected to the community as a married woman. Um, and what's represented here? I see three things. The past, the older men, the present, the wedding, the future, the children to come who will continue to praise the divine. Miriam, Miriam had Vizansky's book because Benjamin Zemach brought him in to teach the dances to his company. Zemach had been in Habima theaters, premiere of the Dybbuk in Moscow in 1922. So this is the centennial. Both of these men carried in their bodies the way Ashkenazic Jews gestured and danced. In 1969, Miriam had produced a half hour documentary, The Art of Benjamin Zemach, which shows four dances he choreographed between the 1920s to the 50s. Underlying his movements and gestures is a real geschmack, flavorful feel of authenticity in them that Vizansky also had. Uh, the clip I'm about to show you um, will show you part of one dance, um, but I also want to show you the introduction to it because he talks about what I'm talking about. In my best moments, it seems I always felt that something comes through me. It is a representation, either of the past or of the people or of the present. It's going to the roots. It's a matter of the work and what you do being larger and bigger than yourself. It's a matter of, in a small degree, representing more people than only yourself. So what inspired Anski to write the Dybbuk? That's an interesting little journey too. Born into Hasidic tradition in Belarus and Hader educated until the age of 12, Anski leaves school to help his abandoned mother run a tavern to help support him and his two sisters. Lifelong friends with Chaim Zhidlovsky, they helped found the Socialist Revolutionary Party. Zhidlovsky also becomes president, vice president of the Chernovitz Yiddish Language Conference of 1908 that declares Yiddish to be a national language of the Jewish people. 
But Anski rejects his Jewish identity and transfers his deep concerns for humanity to the rural peasants and miners of the Russian Empire. He writes Russian stories and is first published in 1882 when he's 19, which is his age here in this photo. By age 23, he's living in Ukraine to really understand and report on the Russian people's struggles. He spends three years working in salt and coal mines. He believes in the importance of Russia's rural population for its future and the moral debt that intellectuals owe them. Influenced by Tolstoy and others on literacy, literacy, he often reads publicly to peasants and miners. But as a radical anti-Czarist, he must leave. And from 19, 1891 to 1905, he lives in Paris and Switzerland, writing on intellectual and economic life in Europe for Russian newspapers. Meanwhile, the Yiddish literary scene has grown. The stories of I.L. Parrots, of the spiritually poor, of the spirituality, very important, the spirituality of poor um, rural Jews draws Omsky back to his mother tongue and everything he's done for the Russian poor, he now wants to do for his own people, to organize aid, to document and tell Jewish stories. After years of Russian ethnography, Jewish ethnography becomes his way back. In 1912, his ethno Jewish ethnographic expedition is funded by wealthy Jewish businessman, Baron Horace Ginsburg. His team of three or four rotating people collect ritual and other objects. They take 2,000 photos, write down 1,800 folk tales, 15,000 folk songs, 1,000 melodies, and record 500 wax cylinders. There was also a questionnaire of 2,087 questions. We have the questions. <clears throat> the answers were all lost, although some lie in the play. There are questions, there are some questions related to dance. There's a few. Uh, question number 1267 is, describe how the kosher dance of the community men with the bride takes place. The next question, do people dance with a handkerchief? And the next question, 1269, is list all the Jewish dances in which you know and describe how they take place. And um, he mentions a kazachka, we would call a kazatsky, uh, kestad merachdin, which refers back to that Talmudic passage, a mazel tov dance, a shemela, a little name, and I don't know what that is, so I have more research to do. A share, a scissors dance, which Byzantsky called a quadrille, a square dance. Question 1271 has to do with leading the groom's family back to the inn, the farewell dance. Where did the expedition go? to Volhynia and Podolia, the cradle of Hasid Hasidism, both in Ukraine. Um, and you can see, I hope you can see my cursor. Here's Kyiv. Um, so Podolia is where the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism was born in 1698. And this here, Mejbush is where he lived and died. His great grandson, Rabbi Nachman of Breslau, born in 1771, also born there in Mejbush, lived mainly in Breslau. Let me find you Breslau, which is over here called Bratslav. And then he moved towards the end of his life, the very end of his life, to Uman, where he died, right here, and is buried. His fantastical metaphorical stories 
were published after his death, including The Mountain and the Heart of the World, that a, mystery, a mysterious stranger tells in the Dybbuk. Plane loads of his followers, until the last couple of the years, arrive annually to gather on Rosh Hashanah at his grave to pray all day and then dance all night at a nearby hall. They circle in concentric circles with the best dancers in the inner circle, building up speed and athleticism as they continue. During the expeditions, Ansky has the idea for the Dybbuk play and completes it in 1914. Written in Russian for Konstantin Stanislavsky's Moscow Art Theater, with whom he already had contact, it is approved and announced for production in 1917. But World War I and Bolshevism, the revolution, intervene. As an opponent of Bolshevism and fearful for his safety, Ansky leaves yet again, this time for Vilna. He connects there with the Vilna Truppe, a Yiddish art theater company who want to stage the Dybbuk, but in Yiddish. They all, for some reason I don't know, move to Warsaw, where he translates it for them. All the while, he is still politically writing and organizing aid for Jews wherever he is. Ill with diabetes and angina, Ansky dies suddenly in Warsaw in 1920 at age 57. The Vilna Truppe stages the play's premiere performance there. as a memorial to him. He is buried in Warsaw alongside I.L. Peretz, Jacob Dinizan, and himself. The next company to perform the Dybbuk was the Habima Theater, founded by Nahum Bezemach in Bialystok in 1912. An outgrowth of Jewish nationalism and Zionism, Habima dedicated itself to performing in Hebrew. From Bialystok, the company went to Moscow in 1917, becoming one of the national theaters of the Moscow Art Theater, along with Ukrainian and Armenian companies. While there, Nahum's younger brother, Benjamin, studied dance, along with theater and became a noted American choreographer and director, as well as a teacher of Stanislavski's approach to acting, to some noted actors, by the way. Habima, wanting to perform, I got ahead of myself, this is who I want. Um, Habima, wanting to perform Divik in Hebrew, had already asked the great Zionist poet, Chaim Nachman Bialik, to translate it in 1919. The following photos that you'll see all belonged to Zema and were amongst his papers. So Vachtan Goff became the person to direct the play, the Armenian Vachtan Goff, who was a protege of Stanislavski's. Unfortunately, he was ill and while hospitalized for cancer and in a bed next to a rabbi, Vachtan Goff observed how the rabbi's emotions were expressed in his gestures and realized that he should focus on developing the existing expressivity of Jewish gesture. Stretching the gestures beyond realism could carry as much or more meaning than realistic detail. This observation made possible the leap from Stanislavski's natural style to the supernaturalism of the Dybbuk's spirit world. The larger exaggerated expressionistic gestures make up and sets along with the folk music and um, dance that Ansky had collected, created a kind of opera ballet, a modern expression for the time of the mystical Hasidic and Kabbalistic world. 
Note the exaggerated gestures and the unfurling of not a flag, but the words Shema Yisrael held high across the top of the stage. As if to say, this is who we are. The Jewish and Gentile world, art world attended, none of whom knew Hebrew, but mysterious and mystical, it was a great success. Dybbuk was the perfect vehicle for Habima, whose agenda was to create work with the archetypal universality of biblical characters and events. Here's a few more photos. Now to the 1937 film. It was a Polish Jewish production using both traditional music from the play and a score by Hanech Kohn. Realistic in costumes, makeup, and scenery it keeps the play's supernatural character through movie magic. It was one of the first films to use superimposed images to erase the time and space boundaries between life and the life beyond death. With editor Lucinda Luvas, we used it in remix to visualize my feeling of possession by the past and my wish to reconnect with it as I danced. The Dybbuk Films choreographer was Judith Berg. Coming from a traditional family, she knew the wedding dances, but went on to study modern dance in Burj and then dance expressionism in Dresden with the major figure of that new style, Mary Vigman. It was a form that sometimes used masks and grotesque, grotesque movement, as it was called, meaning stylized or unnatural, to emphasize, emphasize themes of um, and of emotions. Berg had worked with several Yiddish theater companies, given dance re concerts, and had one of the few accredited modern dance studios in Warsaw. Later, she escaped to Russia ahead of the Germans, married actor-dancer Felix Fidish, uh, and performed with him in the Soviet East during the war. Repatriated afterwards, they started a dance school for Jewish children at a DKP camp. Emigrating to the U.S. in 1950, they taught and toured their, their programs throughout the North and South America. In 2010, I met and interviewed Felix, a cherished Yiddish folk dance teacher in New York City until his death in 2014. Berg was indeed a good match for a film needing traditional dances and something otherworldly. What becomes otherworldly is a grotesque mitzvah dance. Instead of dancing with her father, death comes to dance with Leah. And she sees her dead beloved in its skeletal face. His lost soul has been brought back by her love. And she is comforted, not frightened. Okay, let me see if I can... Pause this for a moment. Okay. <clears throat> Death is continually present in the story, but so is memory. And what goes wrong when a vow is forgotten and an identity hidden? The characters are haunted by the past before it is revealed. That's how I felt haunted by only the faintest memories from my childhood that I didn't want to be only shadows. And I wanted to know more about my grandparents' milieu, if not their own lives. Death is and is not the theme of Dybbuk or Remix. For Leah, it's a new beginning, a reunification of her true love. For me, my adventures have been a revelation and a reunification of my Yiddish self spent her first four years as Luma Karen, named after my mother's beloved mother, with the secular dance artist I became. 
another song Ansky collected and used to open both and to open to both open and close the play was Mip Ne Ma. Why oh why does the soul plunge from the utmost height to the lowest depth? The seed of redemption of the upward flight is contained within the fall. The cycle of life continues. Running throughout the lives of Bonsky and the Jewish artists of that time is identity. How to keep or redeem from loss who they were as a culture, as a people, and yet be in the present. We know this issue only too well globally right now. What part of identity should anyone fight to keep? What should we define and honor in ourselves and in all others? What did and still does cry out to be expressed? One last note from Ukraine. Last year, I learned that many of the original wax cylinders from the Ansky expeditions were not lost as I had once read. They came to light during the mid 1990s when the Jewish section of the Vernatsky National Library of Ukraine gathered collections that had been dispersed around Kyiv, either forgotten or hidden because official Soviet policies toward Jewish materials were not favorable. They have been digitized by the Institute of Information Recording of the Ukrainian Academy of Science in Kyiv and four CDs titled Treasure of Jewish Culture in Ukraine were made. For a conference of Ansky scholars at Stanford University in 2006, from which I showed you that map, sociologist and performer, musicologist, forgive me, musicologist and performer Michael Albert created an album. It's called The Upward Flight, containing several of the old recordings and new versions. Michael's version of Dybbuk Negan from the play and the film I've included in Remix. He connected me with Lyudmila Sholokova, who had produced the recordings, had cataloged, I should say, cataloged the recordings at the Vernatsky. Now at the New York Public Library, she connected me to the Recording Institute. Just this past December, I was able to license a song from them, which opens my film. Reading UNESCO's report of damages, I hope the cylinders are once again hidden, but not forgotten. I'm about to show my film, which somehow, the normal buttons I press, let's see. There we go.
pilgrims to this town, where Jews no longer live, though their past is preserved. At the old cemetery, with its wall of desecrated gravestones without graves. In the old synagogue, filled with pre-war photos, where klezmer music plays. Half the town's population was Jewish when the Dybbuk was filmed here. Some of the old Yiddish folk dances are preserved in it and in other classic Yiddish films shot here back then. I have watched them more than once to learn these dances and I can hardly believe that now I am here. This history is with me. I have taken the old dances into my body to possess them, but now here they possess me. Without plan, I hand over my camera and dance. Thank you.
I know there are some questions that people are uh, uh, wanting to ask, and I'm going to turn uh, to Dominica uh, to uh, present those questions. Um, please answer the questions. Uh, Michael had a question for you uh, that was in uh, the the questions, and uh, let's focus on on what you have uh, shared with us. Um, and uh, Dominica, could you uh, help us with uh, the questions that appeared in? Actually, I'm I'm seeing them. I do see them. Okay. Um, so I see uh, from Michael. Uh, the Zemach footage is great. What year is it from? So um, the film was made in 1969. Um, the dance you saw goes back to 1929. Um, he was already in America, and I will tell this little story. He was taking classes and had performed, um, not in her company, but alongside uh, on a mixed program with um, Martha Graham. And uh, they had become good friends. And they went their separate ways, both with the idea of looking for what was authentic to them. Um, he went to Palestine and this was a major dance. So it's a longer piece that he performed when he came back. Um, so that's when it's it's from. Um, I'm not seeing, are there any other questions? A so um, if there are no other questions, let me just make one announcement about our work with um, Ukrainian refugees. 
um, and a general announcement about our work with Freighted Legacies. Uh, we're very excited about this series. Um, uh, you can go uh, to www uh, Jewish Renewal in Poland to see a number of the cultural and historical um, interviews and programs that we uh, have been doing. Um, the aforementioned uh, novel has been optioned uh, as a TV program, and we are looking forward to that. It's a long time in uh, coming for, uh, uh, forward, uh, the Tree of Life as a uh, television program. Um, I want to mention that uh, we are um, intimately involved with Ukrainian Relief. Uh, at the current time, we have 35 child care centers under what we call the uh, Korchak Child Program. Uh, we have another uh, approximately 55 that will come on line all over Poland. These are centers for children uh, to allow their mothers to find work and know that their children are, are cared for. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, you will be able to support not only our work of our community, but also to support the work of addressing the um, child relief um, that's uh, so necessary. Um, we depend on that support. And uh, we appreciate the effort of uh, everyone that has uh, been uh, involved with us. Um, and I want to thank specifically um, Mark Yazowski, who uh, this time has spent all of his time um, uh, interpreting. Um, and uh, would like to thank uh, Dominica, who's been uh, involved with the uh, technical and uh, managerial uh, issues on the ground in, in Warsaw, uh, and a, a very warm and uh, uh, special thanks to Karen, who I know has worked so hard. And we are scheduling very soon um, a special session uh, so that we can see uh, this video uh, without technical difficulties. Uh, we want to wish everyone um, a special uh, uh, opportunity now to uh, uh, celebrate a, a, a little ray of light um, uh, for the Ukrainian people, uh, perhaps for our democratic system uh, in America. And um, uh, thank you all for participating today. Um, we wish you a good day. Thank you so, all for being here. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you.